We left off finishing off our milligrams to millimoles to milli equivalents and talking about electrolytes and we're still kind of in that same mode here. You got to know the milligrams to milimoles and milli equivalents but now we're going to add something different. Instead of the chemical activity we are going to be talking about osmotic forces in terms of calculating milliosmoles and osmolarity. Didn't we already do that? Didn't we already talk about osmotic forces? Okay, now I'm a little worried for you, only in the sense that I started trying to record the chapter 11 to 15 reviews lecture, and holy cow, we've covered, by the time we're ready for your quiz too, there's a lot of content, not the least of which, if you remember back, was isotonicity. So I will, later on in this talk, lecture, we'll bring up isotonicity again, because it was also a measure of osmotic forces, but we're not talking about isotonicity in this sense yet. We are talking about osmolarity and osmotic forces. The unit for that is going to be the milliosmol, all right? And this in your mind, and we talked about you know, last lecture, was about electrical charges and valences. This time we're talking about particles. It's all about the particles, not the charges. So let's start. These are, I still think they're very easy. We're going to start with the easiest, which is for non-electrolytes. And remember that that's a chemical that when you put it into solution doesn't fall apart. It doesn't dissociate. It doesn't expose electrical charges. So a good example would be something like dextrose or glucose, okay? So dextrose, since it's a non on electrolyte, if you put one millimole of dextrose in liquid, does it change? No. So we say that's equivalent to one milliosmol. Okay, so one millimole of a non electrolyte is equal to one milliosmol of osmotic forces. So let's do a simple question with that. So let's do the uh, problem below. It says a solution that contains 2.5% of dextrose with a molecular weight of 180. Okay, how many milliosmoles per liter are represented by this concentration? Okay, and I'll remind you the point of this was we know that dextrose is a non-electrolyte. You're going to see that's going to be very important here in a bit. Okay, so let's start with this. Remember, it wanted to know how many milliosmoles per liter, so let's start with a liter. All right, if we start with 1,000 milliliters and we look at the concentration of dextrose as 2.5 percent, which is a weight per volume, which means 2.5 grams per 100 milliliters. So if I do that and multiply that way, then my milliliters cancel. I know how many grams. I know the weight of my dextrose in that solution. Let's convert grams to milligrams, so we multiply by a thousand, so now we're in milligrams, and this is the key thing, I don't hopefully you know it, but now let's convert from the weight of our dextrose to the number of molecules by dividing by the formula weight. So the formula weight was 180, so if I divide by 180 milligrams, I have one millimole on top, that's my conversion, so that I can convert from my weight to my number of molecules, so I'm now in millimoles. The only new trick, the thing that's a little unique that we're doing today is focusing on the number of particles. All right, so in the particles, remember how the valence went with the milliequivalents? The particles go with the milliosmoles. So if it's a non-electrolyte and you put one in, how many do you get when you get done? And in the water, you get one out of it. So you get one milliosmole for one every one millimole. So again, millimoles now cancel, and you get your units in milliosmoles. And if you do that math across, you should get 139. So a 2.5% concentration of dextrose. If you have a liter of that solution, you have the equivalent of 139 milliosmoles per liter of osmotic pressure. Okay? Pretty easy, right? The whole real trick to that is, A, you should know how to do this by now, I hope. This is the new thing here, and we're counting particles. And you'll see that's what we're going to do today. All right, so let's make it a little more difficult. That was a non-electrolyte. What makes an electrolyte special? It's a chemical that when you put it in water, it dissociates. It has parts that come, up, that, that, that come apart from itself. So you form multiple parts. How many parts? Depends on the chemical formula. All right, so let's take a simple example of sodium chloride. We've used that a lot, right? NaCl, sodium chloride. It, as a solid, it's a crystal to begin with, but you put it in solution, it dissociates into what? A sodium molecule and a chloride molecule. So one one parent compound, one molecule of sodium chloride, has how many particles in solution? Two. One sodium, one chloride. That's, that's it. It's not, this is not hard, so let's do these. Let's use the question for an example. In this case, it's very similar, but now instead of a non-electrolyte, we have an electrolyte. It says a solution contains 2.5%, but this time of potassium chloride, which is the formula KCl and the molecular weight that I give you. How many milliosmoles per liter are represented by this concentration? Let's do it the same way. It's the same question, it's just instead of dextrose, we've got potassium chloride. So let's start again with the fact that we're doing it per liter. So there's the amount per liter. So I'll start with 1,000 milliliters. My 2.5% concentration is 2.5 grams per 100 mils. That way mils cancel, I'm in grams. I convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by, ooh, Larry, 
1,000 <laughs> grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. And then we will get rid of the weight in milligrams and we'll convert that to the number of molecules by again multiplying by the fact that in one millimole there is 74.5 milligrams. That's the formula weight of potassium chloride. I'm now in the molecules of what? Potassium chloride. So the last question is, when it dissociates, when we put it in water, since it is an electrolyte, how many particles do we get? We get a potassium and we get a chloride. How many particles is that? That's two. So there's where we get our two. So if we multiply by two, millimoles cancel. And again, we'll go across. And our final answer would be 671, but the units would be milliosmoles per what? Per, per liter. That was the amount per liter. Questions? I hope not. Pretty straightforward. Okay. So this is similar, right? This is kind of similar to what we did for, for milliequivalence or for chemical activity, but I wanted to make sure you understand counting particles is not exactly the same thing as counting charges or valence like we do for milliequivalence. They can be the same number sometimes, but sometimes they're not. So I thought this was kind of an interesting table that kind of goes through. Let's go through just a couple of compounds and count the particles and we'll count the charges if we were doing milliequivalence to make sure you could understand how we would get both of those. So let's start with a non-electrolyte. Our favorite one is dextrose, all right, it's the most commonly one used. So dextrose, sugar molecule, non-electrolyte, how many particles? One particle. That complex molecule doesn't dissociate, so we just get one particle. Since it doesn't dissociate, does it expose any sort of charge? No, there's no valence, there's no charge because it's not an electrolyte. It does not change, so it's still the same parent molecule in water. So you have one particle, but zero milliequivalence. So far so good? Let's jump to our potassium chloride, the one we just kind of did. When it is an electrolyte, it will dissociate and separate into what? One potassium and one chloride. All right, so how many particles? Two. Does that mean the valence is two because there's a positive one and a negative one? No, they balance each other out. So how many potassiums do you get? One. And how many, what's the charge on a potassium? One. What is one times one? One. So the valence is one, so the valence is one, and the particles are one, so one times one is one. The electrolytes would be one electrolyte. Okay, or one mill equivalent, not electrolyte, one mill equivalent. Magnesium sulfate. This is where I just want to make sure you, it can differ here a little bit. Magnesium sulfate, just like potassium chloride, splits in half, right? Magnesium sulfate comes to one magnesium and one sulfate. So how many particles? Two. Magnesium sulfate, two particles. But the valence on that, what is the charge on a magnesium in a sulfate? It's, a, it's two. It's either a positive two for the magnesium or a negative sulf, uh, two for the sulfate, but you still only have one molecule for those, so you get a mel equivalence of two, two mel equivalents because of the valence, and the particles are one or two. Good Lord, two. One for magnesium, one for sulfate. All right? Calcium chloride, I know this is not exciting. I'm just I'll try to go through fast. Calcium chloride splits into three things. You get one calcium, one chloride, one chloride, right? There are two chlorides, so calcium chloride, chloride. That's one, two, three, three particles. But there the mel equivalents are again going to be two because the charge on calcium is two. Now, what's the charge on chloride? It's only one, but how many particles do we have? Two. So what is two times the number of negative ones? That would be a negative two. So we still get a mel equivalence of two. All right? Potassium citrate, a little more complicated, is because the citrate molecule is a negative three charge valence, negative three on citrate, so you have to have three potassiums, three positive ones to match up with the negative three on the citrate, so how many molecules? Three potassiums, one citrate gives you four molecules, but only a three valence, okay? The charge is three, either three times plus one, or negative three, the valence, uh, mel equivalents are three. Okay, and lastly, then no, kind of the trickiest one of the bunch would be calcium citrate because again we said the citrate's negative three, calcium is a positive two, so you got to have three calciums to go along with two citrates to be able to equalize the charges. So again, the particles there would be three calciums plus two citrates, or how many? Three plus two is five, so there would be five particles to go towards the milliosmoles, but from a valence standpoint, it would be six, okay? Either three times negative, or three times positive two, or two times negative three, so it would be a six milliequivalence. Do you see the difference between those? Maybe I didn't speak through that very well, and maybe it is completely obvious, but I am concerned you have to use the chemical formula to do the m particles, but you have to use the valence when we're doing the mel equivalents. So those are the big differences between the two. The last thing I'll try to say quickly on these is, we're going to be, I'm going to ask you on the exam on these questions for osmolarity. Osmolarity is just like molarity. Molarity is what? Moles per liter, right? Or millimoles per liter if you're doing millimolarity. But uh, osmolarity is milliosmoles per liter, and then we're going to treat the same thing as osmolality. 
Osmolality is the amount per 1,000 grams or one kilogram, whereas osmolarity is per 1,000 milliliters. And since we're going to say the concentrations of these electrolytes are so negligible that they don't offset the weight per the volume, then we're going to treat 1,000 grams like 1,000 milliliters since we're reference source is water. So that's a big thing. And the only reason is that some of the, and I'm going to show you, show you some of the labels from the commercial products. Sometimes they say osmolarity, but sometimes they may give you an osmolality. We're going to treat the numbers as exactly the same since water is the reference source. Okay, so just be aware of that. Let's do something exciting. So here's our first question. It says, for 147 milliliters of a 10% calcium chloride, and I give you the formula, CaCl2, but this is the dihydrate, the molecular order 147 solution. So for that solution, calculate a, the number of millimoles, the number of milliequivalents of calcium, and the number of milliosmoles in the solution. All right, and I give you a picture, and you can even see some of the answers there in the picture, but let's work through them. All right, so that's is a real commercial product, but we're starting with 147 milliliters, so be careful with that. That's what we want. So our first question, letter A, is to calculate the millimoles. Let's based off of the millimoles from 147 milliliters. So we'll start with the milliliters. Let's multiply it by its concentration. It's 10%. 10% is 10 grams per 100 milliliters. Hopefully you're getting used to that. So if I multiply that, milliliters cancel, and I'm in grams. And lastly, let's convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams per gram so that grams cancel. And we get, if you do that simple math, you get 14,700 milligrams of calcium chloride dihydrate. So far, so good? All we now know is we've converted our volume of 147 mils to the weight of calcium chloride dihydrate in that amount of volume based off of its concentration. So let's take that same number. So again, we keep going here. We want to take that weight and convert it to the number of molecules, to the number of millimoles. You should hopefully know how to do this. We're going to multiply that by the fact that let's use its formula weight. I was given the formula weight here of 147, so I'll put that down here and multiply by the fact that I have one millimole of calcium chloride dihydrate for every molecular weight, which is 147 milligrams. Now my milligrams cancel, and I'm in the number of molecules of the calcium chloride dihydrate, and the answer is 100 millimoles. And that's the answer to letter A. Okay. You feel good about that? I see you all taking notes, which is good, and you're so serious. Hopefully this is, yeah, 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 I know how to do this. We've been doing this a lot, so hopefully you feel comfortable on that. Now, the next question wants the number of milliequivalents. This is kind of what we did last week, right? So we should be comfortable. So starting with, again, this is the number of molecules I have. We just calculated 100 millimoles of the calcium chloride dihydrate. First thing we're going to do is, though, we want the milliequivalents of Calcium. So we have to go from the number of molecules of the parent compound, calcium chloride dihydrate, to just the number of molecules of calcium. So this is where you have to look at the formula. How many calciums are there in a calcium chloride? One. So that's where the one comes from. There is one calcium molecule in the molecule parent compound of calcium chloride. How many chlorides would there have been if we were going to measure the milliequivalents of chloride? It would have been two, right? In this case, though, there's only one calcium in calcium chloride. So now that lets me cancel the molecules of calcium chloride dihydrate, and I'm now just in the number of molecules of calcium. To calculate the milliequivalents, remember to take the valence on the ion. So in this case, it's a positive two. So that's where the valence goes to. We'll put it as two milliequivalents of calcium for every one millimole, so that my millimoles cancel, and I did 200 milliequivalents of calcium. Okay? So that was that one. Now, this is what's new here a little bit, is millimoles, all right? And this is the trick. You don't start at milliequivalents. Milliequivalents is about chemical activity. It's about electricity. That's separate. We want milliosmoles, the osmotic pressure, and that's dependent on the number of molecules, the number of particles, all right? So to answer this question, we have to go back to their starting number of millimoles. Okay, I don't care how many milliequivalents I have. We have 100 millimoles of calcium chloride dihydrate, all right? That's how many molecules. What I need to do is determine how many particles come out of that, all right? So how many particles come out of that mo those molecules? Well, let's look at the formula there. Do we care about the dihydrate? We want to know the amount of particles in water. Water is water. It's not a particle. Water is water. So don't ignore the dihydrate stuff. That doesn't count. The only thing that's going to be floating in the water are the calciums and the chlorides. And would you agree there's one calcium and how many chlorides? Two chlorides, right? So one plus two is three. So not rocket science, but that's where the three comes from, from the fact that calcium chloride here, you get one calcium and you get two chlorides, all right? So three. So 100 times three, essentially, because these units cancel, means you get 300 milliosmoles 
from that. Is that the right answer? Can we check that with our label up there? Because do you see, what does it say up here? I, okay, you see you can't read it. It says 2.04 milliosmoles per milliliter. 2.04 milliosmoles per liter is what it is up there. Do me a favor, you got your calculators out if you're still awake. Take 300, what is 300 divided by, that's the number of milliosmoles, but that was per 147. But do you agree, remember how we started with 147? What's 300 divided by 147? you should get 2.04. So that matches up with what's labeled on the actual product. So that's one way we can kind of confirm that our math is right. This is the way you do these questions. All right? Let us move on. This one's a little, works the same way. It's a little more onerous. So let's see. It says, what is the osmolarity? Well, again, osmolarity means milliosmoles per liter of a 10% dextrose with 0.45% sodium chloride solution. All right, so it wants to know the total osmolarity. Would you agree, if I didn't say it already, osmolarity is going to be additive, right? So it doesn't matter what kind of particles they are, you count the total number of particles. We're going to count particles from dextrose, then we're going to count particles from sodium chloride, and what do you think we're going to do at the end? Add them together. It doesn't matter what kind of particles they are, we're going to add up the total number of particles. And lastly, in terms of where to start with this, I would remind you, it wants to know osmolarity, which is the milliosmoles per what? per liter. So again, if you had a little hard time starting this question, it's again, it wants to know the amount per liter. So let's start with a liter. Let's start with a thousand milliliters and let's just do one at a time. So I'm going to start with the dextrose and let's do dextrose. So again, this is why I started here with a thousand milliliters. Start with a thousand mils. Let's multiply it by its concentration. It said it was 10%. Hopefully you know that means now 10 grams per 100 mils. So mils cancel when I multiply that out. Let's convert it to milligrams by simply multiplying by 1,000 so that I convert grams to milligrams. How do I get to the number of molecules? I divide by the formula weight. So again, to go from weight to molecules, I'm going to divide by the molecular weight so that my milligrams cancel and I end up in millimoles. I'm now in the number of molecules. So my question to you is, when dextrose goes into water, how many particles does it form? One, it doesn't change, it's the non-electrolyte. So we get one milliosmole for every one millimole, so the millimoles cancel. If you do that math across, you should get 505 and your units would be milliosmoles. Is that the answer to this question? No, that's just the force from the dextrose. We still got to figure out how much is coming from our sodium chloride. So you ready to do that one? Let's do that one. And again, I try to set these up so that they look the same because they are the same. It is the same calculation with one difference. So bear with me on this. We're still starting with a liter, so we'll start with 1,000 mils. Let's convert it to the weight using its concentrations. Remember, its concentration is different. It was 0 0.45, so that's why I'm going to multiply it by 0 0.45 grams over 100 milliliters. Okay, and that's so that mils cancel. Again, multiply by 1,000 to convert grams to milligrams. All right. Then to convert the weight, milligrams, to the number of molecules, millimoles, what do I divide by? The formula weight, so that's where the formula weight comes in, down here. So now milligrams get converted to millimoles. And then lastly, from the parent molecule of sodium chloride, I need to count the number of particles. So if you have NaCl, when it dissolves, you'll get one sodium and one chloride. So one plus one equals Two, and that's where the two comes from. So there we have it. So two milliosmoles per one parent molecule, millimoles of cancel, and we're in milliosmoles. So do that math. I get 154. And is that the answer? Oh, the answer is the sum of the both. And that's kind of important. Make sure, because we're going to do a big one here at the end. We're going to have lots of stuff. In the end, milliosmoles are just the total number of particles. So I would argue you have 505 coming milliosmoles from the dextrose plus the 154 from the sodium chloride. Gives you a total of 659. That would be the final answer to this question. Okay? All right, let's do a little more detailed question, a little, a little broader. We'll do some other things other than just the milliosmoles. So it says, a hospital pharmacist fills a medication order calling for an IV fluid of 5% dextrose in 0.9% sodium chloride and 40 milliequivalents of potassium. And all of that is in a one liter bag or so a thousand milliliters, okay? It's a little tricky here. It says the IV infusion is administered through a set that delivers 15 drops per milliliter. Now, the infusion has been running at a rate of 12 drops per minute for 15 hours. 
a little information overload. Are you with me on that? So there's a lot of stuff there. We'll come back to it, but there's got a rate. We got an infusion rate and all of that stuff. So how are you? Anyway, so let's come back to it. So we got potassium, we got sodium chloride, and dextrose. And I give you all of the information from that. So with that one bag, and I can show you in the label here, there's the label of the, the bag. So you've got all those ingredients in there. And let's do one question at a time. It wants to know how many malequivalents of potassium chloride have been administered. Okay? We know that there were 40 malequivalents put into that liter bag, right? Are you okay with that? We have a concentration, 40 malequivalents of potassium per the one liter. Okay, so right there. But we don't know how much of the bag has been administered. So we got to start with the fluid. How much of that IV bag has been in administered. Well, it depends on how long has it been running and at what rate has it been infused at. So let's start with time. What is the one thing that we know for sure that's fixed? 15 hours. Okay, so that's where we need to start with. I'm just trying to help you kind of between all that information overload, we've got so many drops per mil, we have so many drops per minute, but what we know is we've infused this IV for 15 hours. So let's start with that. So if we start with 15 hours, the first thing I'm going to do is convert that to minutes. Okay, and you'll see why here in a minute. So 15 hours times 60 minutes per hour so that my hours cancel. And all I've got is my 15 hours in minutes now. And the reason I wanted minutes is because I was given the number of drops that I get per minute. So if I have infused this for so many minutes, I can convert that to drops. So if I multiply that by 12 drops per minute, then minutes cancel and I'm now in drops. So far so good? Now, I don't like drops, that's a weird number. Let's convert that to a volume in milliliters, right? So I have a conversion. I know this IV set has 15 drops per milliliter. So let's multiply it by that, expressed as one milliliter on top over 15 drops so that the drops cancel. And now I have the volume. I know how many milliliters I've infused in 15 hours. Okay, do you see how that worked? So the last thing to figure out how much potassium is in that, let's multiply it by the concentration. We were told that we had 40 milliequivalents in 1,000 milliliters. So that's the, that's the concentration right there, and I put it that way so that milliliters cancel. And when I multiply straight across, I get this final answer of 28.8 milliequivalents of potassium. Okay, on that one, that's a lot of steps, but if you just, that's why I still say I love the dimensional analysis and set up your units before you do any math. Just set the numbers and the numbers and the numbers and make sure your units cancel before you try to multiply or divide anything, all right? And that should work out for you. So let's go on. It says how many millimoles of potassium chloride have been administered? We know how many milliequivalents, how many millimoles? So we can work backwards here because we already answered the milliequivalents. So let's convert our milliequivalents back and go the opposite direction. And let's go from milliequivalents to millimoles. It's pretty straightforward. What is, and I take a step here, well, anyway, so what is the valence on potassium and chloride? It's a one, right? It has a positive one valence on potassium. So the milliequivalents would have one, because again, K is K plus. I can't even read that, good Lord. All right, so, bad Larry. All right, so it's one milliequivalent for every one millimole, so hopefully you see that comes from the valence. So if I just multiply that across, do you realize that that means we also have administered 28.8 millimoles? Because the valence on potassium is one, therefore we get the same number of millimoles as we have milliequivalents. Okay? And lastly, just going backwards, it says how many grams of potassium chloride? Well, let's take that answer in molecules and convert it back to weight. How do we convert molecules to the weight of those molecules? Is we multiply by the formula weight. And we were said that the formula weight for potassium chloride is 74.5. So if we multiply 28.8 millimoles times 74.5 milligrams per millimole, millimoles cancel. Lastly, to convert it to grams, let's just multiply by one gram over a thousand, well, a thousand milligrams so that we get that grams as our final unit and that should be your final answer there. 2.15 grams of potassium chloride. This, despite my maybe bungled efforts here, was kind of a review of what we have already done. That's kind of what we did last week. So those are those still important skills. So let's go forward a little bit and basically say with the same solution, what is the total osmolarity? Okay, osmolarity is in units of milliosmoles per liter. Luckily we started, we have a liter bag, so we don't really have to change the volume. Let's just count the particles, all right? So let's start with the dextrose. Remember, we're wanting it per liter there, so that's why we're going to start with our 1,000 milliliters times the dextrose was 
So five grams per 100 milliliters, I'm in grams of dextrose. Convert that to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. I'll remind you, here's the molecular weight of the dextrose. So I'm just going to go ahead and divide by the molecular weight so that my units of weight cancel. And I'm now, in, again, in molecules of dextrose. Dextrose, you hopefully now have painfully learned that it is a non-electrolyte, right? So in solution, you'll only get one particle for every one millimole. So there's one milliosmole for every one millimole. So millimoles cancel. And you could do that math across, you would get 253 milliosmoles. But we're not done, right? That was just the dextrose. So let's do the same thing for the sodium chloride. Again, we're doing it for a liter, so we start with 1,000 mils. But remember, its concentration is 0.9%, so that's where we have 0.9 grams per 100 mils. This way, milliliters cancel. I'm in grams. Convert grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Convert the weight to the number of molecules by dividing by its molecular weight, and sodium chloride's molecular weight is 58.5. Now my weight cancels. I'm in the number of molecules of sodium chloride. That parent compound, what is the formula for sodium chloride? NaCl. When it dissociates into its electrolytes, you'll get one sodium, one chloride. That means there are two particles for that one parent molecule. So if I multiply by two milliosmoles per one millimole of sodium chloride, millimoles cancel, and I would get 308 milliosmoles. All right. The last little bitty tricky thing, I won't say it's a little trick, is it's easier, is you got to do the potassium chloride. Keep in mind, it was 40 milliequivalents per the 1,000 milliliter, so we're just going to start with the total amount there, which was 40 milliequivalents. But let's convert that back to millimoles by multiplying by the fact that there's one milliequivalent per every one millimole, since the valence on the potassium is one. So again, we have millimoles now. And again, how many, and this is millimoles of the potassium chloride, how many particles come from potassium chloride when it dissociates? Two, one potassium, one chloride. So that's where the two comes from. So we would take the number of molecules of potassium chloride times two to get the 80, and there's that answer. Okay, so we have determined the milliosmoles contributed by each of the three components. So the last step is simply to add them all up together. So there's the amount from the dextrose, the amount from the sodium chloride, and the amount from the potassium chloride. You add all of that up, and I got 641. And if we look here, this is that blow up of that label I showed you earlier from the commercial product, from the same thing we've just been working with, and it's uh, we basically have calculated the same value. Kind of cool to see that our math basically works. I don't know where the one came from. I, I, I think they rounded. So. Okay. Well, let's answer this biggest question here. So let's do this. Uh, the 641 milliosmoles, that's a solution you're putting into the blood. And we said before, and we talked about isotonicity, that generally, and not always, but generally, you'd like to maybe make your products be isotonic so that they're compatible in terms of the osmotic pressures with biologic fluids. So we talked about isotonic, what is it, hypotonic and hypertonic, right? You can either be the same as, meaning iso, lower or higher, hypo or hyper, and we talked about tonic. Now we're saying the same thing. You can use that same term for os osmoles. You can be hyperosmolar, hypoosmolar, hyperosmolar, isoosmolar. So what is the tonicity? Is it the same? Is, the, is isoosmolar the same as isotonic? Okay, and the answer is no and yes. Okay, it's always kind of that complicated in that sense. It's measuring the same thing. Isotonicity says you have the same osmotic pressure on the outside of the cell as you have on the inside of the cell. Remember, we're talking about the division of that semi-permeable membrane. Okay, the only difference is is when we're doing osmolarity, we're doing the total pressure of all solutes. Okay. Anything in solution creates, everything in solution creates osmotic pressure. Is everything in solution uh, separated from the inside, from the outside of a semi-permeable membrane? What does semi-permeable mean? Does it mean some things get through? It means some things get through and other things don't. So here's the problem. If you have, and I'll use, this is kind of, I'll just try to illustrate it with this right here. 
You can have a hyperosmotic solution. That is, the stuff you have in there is more than what you would have from just a biologic fluid. Okay, and you put it on the outside of the semipermeable membrane. What happens though, as the fluid goes in, some of the particles can pass through that membrane. So not only does the water go in to equalize the pressure, but the solutes move in to equalize the pressure, and you can actually have a change in the tonicity because some, not the tonicity of the isomolar forces because some of the solutes go and pass through the cell. Things that can pass through include gases, your oxygens, your di carbon dioxide, there's certain small phospholipids that can pass through these semi-permeable membranes. So when we talk about isotonicity, we are only measuring the forces from non-permeable solutes, things that cannot. And that's generally what we use. When you make an IV, we always talk about isotonicity because the dextroses, they're too big. They don't passively diffuse through there. And your electrolytes, your sodiums, your chlorides, all of those electrolytes, they're charged. They're polar molecules. They are not going to pass through membranes. So most of our IV solutions, when we calculate these forces, we are using solutes and things that are not going to pass through. So we are, our iso, our, essentially our osmotic forces are the same as our tonic forces. Tonicity and and, and uh, the osmotic forces are the same. However, that doesn't mean they're always the same. You can have solutions that essentially that can be both hyperosmotic and isotonic. Why? Because when you initially put them in there, they've got more particles than, uh, than a normal inside of a cell goes, but that solution pushes not only fluid, but those solutes in, and it ends up equalizing. A hypertonic solution will never be isotonic. A hypertonic means it's more than the normal tonicity. And because a tonic solution is only looking at the forces from non-permeating solutes, then it's not going to change once you add it to the fluids. That was probably the worst description ever, but does it kind of make sense? And I don't know if it matters or doesn't matter. A lot of times in, in medicine and pharmacy, we're, our, oso, our osmotic forces are going to be the same as our tonic forces since we will typically only be compounding and using products that do not passively diffuse through biologic tissue. But there you have it. All right, so let's leave that alone. We are, whether it's our hyper, our osmotic forces are going to be the same as our tonic forces. So let's just go ahead and calculate uh, back to the normal thing. So last, this is the last one. It's an involved one. Lactated ringers. Have you ever heard of lactated ringers? It's a different kind of solution using multiple different types of electrolytes to kind of create the, the tonic forces in there. So we have, for every 100 mils, I give you the concentration of four different ingredients, sodium chloride, sodium lactate, potassium chloride, and calcium chloride. And frankly, what I want to do is calculate the overall tonicity. Let's calculate the tonicity of everything all together. All right? And the concentration. So I want to know the melee equivalence per liter. We want to do both. I like this question. You got to do both melee equivalence and you got to do your osmolar stuff. All right? So let's do one at a time. So these all work exactly the same. I also like this. It goes to show that if you can be organized in your approach and set it up for the first ingredient, guess what you need to do for the second ingredient? The same exact thing. So you'll see there's a lot of repetition in this. So we want to know it per liter. I'll still remind you, we want to know the concentration. Oh, that's a nice big circle, per liter. So that's why I'm starting with 1,000 milliliters, all right? So if I need 1,000 milliliters, if I'm going to express the concentration per liter, start with 1,000 mils. The concentration of the first ingredient, sodium chloride, was 600 milligrams per 100 mils. So that's where that comes from there. Set it up so that my milliliters cancel, and I'm in milligrams. Convert milligrams to millimoles by using the molecular weight. So there's my molecular weight. So now my milligrams cancel, and I'm in millimoles of what? Sodium chloride. Still just sodium chloride. So far so good? Now let's just quickly do the particles. Particles are easier. Milliosmoles are way easier than I think than, than well, we'll see, than milliequivalents. How many sodium chloride dissociation to how many particles? Two. So we multiply the number of molecules, 102.7 millimoles, times two, so that we can calculate. So from the sodium chloride, I now how many, know how many milliosmoles of pressure I'll get from my sodium chloride. Okay? The reason I say it's a little bit tricky for the, the milliequivalents is that you get milliequivalents of both sodium and you get milliequivalents from the chloride. You've got to do both. So starting with the number of molecules, coming back down here for both of those, I calculate the milliequivalents of sodium by taking the number of molecules times the fact that the valence on sodium is one, so I have one milliequivalent for every one millimole, so I get the same number of milliequivalents of sodium 
Same thing for chloride. But remember, I'm starting back with the number of molecules of the sodium chloride. So again, 102.7 millimoles of sodium chloride gives me one milliequivalent for every one millimoles, since the charge on chloride is one, and that's where I get 102.7 from the chloride. All right? You see how I did that? And it really, it all starts from the, once I know the number of molecules from the parent compound, I can calculate the number of particles from the parent compound, and then I can measure the number of electrical charges from the parent compound. But it all depends on the number of molecules of the parent compound, all right? So let's do the sodium lactate. I will try to go through this quicker. I'll maybe not play around with the pen so much. 1,000 milliliters, we're doing it per liter, times its concentration of 310 milligrams per 100 mils. That was given to us. Divided by its molecular weight to convert to millimoles, and I get 27.7 millimoles. That's how many molecules of the sodium lactate I would have in that solution. Convert that to milliosmoles by the fact that sodium lactate, even though the lactate's a big molecule, the only thing that separates is the sodium comes off the lactate. So you still only get two particles. So let's take the number of millimoles times two to get the number of milliosmoles, which is here. And then let's do our milliequivalents. Again, since this is the number of our parent molecules, we'll do that for both of them. Take those times the valence. The valence on sodium is one. The valence on lactate is minus one. So again, you get times one, you get the same number of milliequivalents as you do millimoles, and again, just by doing this whole canceling thing. All right? So that's what you get from there. Potassium chloride works about the same way. The only thing I would tell you here, and again, you can, I'm not going to repeat all of these things. They're in there, hopefully, from the slides that you can download. When you get to the millimoles, remember there are two milliosmoles because there's both a potassium and a chloride, so that's why it's two. And again, because the valence here is one, that's why you're only multiplying each of those by one. Okay. And lastly, and maybe a little more difficult, is the calcium chloride dihydrate. We still start with 1,000 mils. We're given that it was at 20 milligrams per 100 mils. We divide by that. Here's our number of parent molecules. Difference here, why did we do three? Because it's a calcium and a chloride and a chloride. So there are three particles, so that's why we got that value. Taking the number of moles back down to here, let's just do this one. This one is a little bit like your quiz question today. Hopefully you kind of know how to do all this. So we had the number of molecules for each of those. For the calcium, again, there are two. It's a positive two charge here. So the valence is two, so we would take the millimoles times two to get to its mill equivalents. Chloride, it's still only got a one valence, but how many chlorides are there? Two for every parent molecule. So I multiply the number of molecules times two, because I have twice as many chlorides as I do just parent molecules, all right? But then I multiply by one, because the valence is one. So that's why, again, I get the 2.7 mill equivalents of chloride as well. The calcium was that because of the valence of two. The chloride's the same answer, not because of the valence. The valence was one, but we get two molecules out of each parent molecule. So the total, if you add all of that up, I show you here. And I will just remind you again, you have sodium from both the sodium chloride and the sodium acetate. Okay? You had chloride from the sodium chloride, the potassium chloride, and the calcium chloride. So again, it doesn't matter where the parent molecule was from. You count up the total number of each of those. So that's where you would get all of those totals from. And remember, the osmolarity would be the same, would be added up from all four of the different ingredients. And lastly, let's just look here. If you did all that math with me, then we can verify. There's the sodium chloride there. So we got the right answer. Here's our potassium, four. That's the answer over there. Calcium, they rounded there a little bit, so we're good. 109 from the chloride is there, and then there's our 28. Uh, there's 28 from that. And lastly, you can see here, with all my scratching, there's the 273. There's our 273. Okay? So, you can go back and kind of look through those when you download those slides if you didn't keep up with me.